Just over the last few days, Warren Buffett has added $115 million worth of Occidental to the Berkshire Hathaway portfolio. It is currently trading to the mid to lower end of the 52-week range. And in today's episode, we want to understand if we should also consider adding this to our portfolio. Now, as always, we are going to do a deep dive on this company. We're also going to take a look at how the performance has been year on year over the last 10 years on their top line revenue as well as bottom line net income. We also want to discuss the health of this company, their total cash versus their total debt. And we want to see how safe is their dividend. It has a 60 board line safe score. We want to run through and understand the underlining supporting metrics like essentially the payout ratio, the debt levels, as well as a few others. And we're going to take a look at how much he's added exactly when. Also consider some insider selling that we have seen over the last 12 months. And we also want to look towards the institutions, understand whether or not similar to Warren, they are also adding this company into their portfolio and adding more shares. And we're also seeing not just how they've performed over the others in their competitors over the last 10 years, but also whether or not this is one that can at least keep up with the S&P 500, even when you do reinvest those dividends. And the major thing of today is we're going to take a look at the valuation in the model, see what is the intrinsic value, what is our acceptable buy price in implementing a margin of safety, and see exactly Wall Street analysts themselves, what is the sort of implied upside percentage-wise that they are expecting for Occidental Petroleum over the next year. So first, let's jump straight into exactly the insider selling and buying that we have been noting. And first off, we want to say that insider ownership does sit around 0.48%, and we note around 843 million worth of insider buys over the last 12 months. We also note insider selling, but it is a lot smaller at 127.5% than the buying that we know. The more recent quarter, so quarter two, 114 million worth of buys. In fact, you would have to go back to quarter three to see any type of selling. That is coming up to nearly a year ago today with some very, very recent insider buys. Now, when we take a look, Berkshire Hathaway, we can see on the 5th of June as well as the 7th of June and two different buys totaling just under $115 million. Now, we do consider insider buying as being a very bullish signal as they buy because they believe the share price will go up. Whether or not you believe this is the case for a major shareholder as opposed to an insider, again, that really comes down to whether or not you want to include it in your own investment thesis. But we can see Berkshire Hathaway, major shareholders, they have bought pretty much across the board over the last year. We see prior to the June buy, they did fact buy on the 21st of December 2023 as well. So that was also a very large amount, $105 million. Information is here if you do want to include this into your own research following the episode today. We then take a look at the institutions. Now, they sit at just under 89%. We know 1.61 billion worth of sales by the institutions over the last 12 months. However, we do know more than double the amount of buys over the same time period. So they are buying a lot more than they are selling. However, what we would point out here is that in quarter one of 2024, a little bit more selling by the insiders than buying. Although overall, as we mentioned, more buying than selling by the institution. We then take a look at essentially the company first for a quick brief historical performance. Over the last year, they are down around 1%. Year to date, again, pretty much flat, so very minimal movement. However, over the last five years, they're up 24%. Over the last 10 years, they're down 40%. Now, do bear in mind that this doesn't include dividends reinvested. And this is really if you had bought 10 years ago today. If you did take advantage of the dip, as we see on March 2020, this was trading for around $10. As we mentioned, trading towards the mid to lower end of the 52-week range, we do have a buy from Seeking Alpha, whereas a hold from both Wall Street and Quant, with a forward yield of around 1.48% and a forward P of around 15.86%. Now, do remember that as that will be key when we do compare that to others in the same sector. Now, in terms of numbers, one thing that we do want to point out before we look, yes, we want to see 3 to 7% as a baseline growth indicator. Bear in mind, though, that with this industry, it is very cyclical, so we will see ups and downs. 19.3 billion reported in 2014, 28.3 billion reported in their latest annual report. So we do see growth, but when we do look at it on a more graphical basis, it isn't a straight line increase over the longer term. What we do, in fact, see is dips, which then do increase and then do fall. And as we can see, just in the more recent year, 
2020 highs of 36.6 billion before dropping down to 28.3. Again, just something to consider when we do look at the numbers as they won't be consistent increases over the longer term. When we take a look at the bottom line net income, in fact, we can go straight to the graphical representation to show you essentially the cyclicality. In fact, we have two of the last 10 years where they reported a net loss and 2022, a very nice essential bottom line 13.3 billion before lowering down to 4.7. So overall 616 million in 2014 around 4.7 in fact in 2023 and across the board we do see a lot of mixed results so something just to consider as we go with this company but also understand this will also impact other oil and gas companies the like the likes of bp shell they'll all be very cyclical now when we take a look at the health of the company 3.8 billion cash in 2014 1.3 billion in their latest quarterly report and again we can in fact see whilst there is some cyclicality across the cash over the longer term it has been depleted still 1.4 billion or in fact 1.3 in their latest quarter isn't anything that is to be a worry but what we always like to do to compare it otherwise that number in isolation doesn't mean anything so we compare that to their total debt numerically and directionally we can see it has increased 6.8 billion in 2014 21 billion in their latest quarterly report and as we can see over the longer term that position from 2014 has increased although we do know from 2019 whilst we saw a massive jump it has started to come down so they do look like they are paying off some of that total debt that they do have sitting on that balance sheet now why this is important why we keep referring it to essentially as the health of the company this will affect that dividend safety score which we will come on to very shortly now what we also like to do is compare analyst estimates versus how the company performed on the earnings per share quick look at their track record as well as their future expectations over the last four quarters we can see they have beaten analyst targets three of the four so a 75 percent track record nice to note the last three consecutively have beaten analyst targets and in fact the next quarter the estimation is there for strong double digit growth to the earnings per share a drop in the following year again most likely to do with seasonality or cyclicality quarter four and quarter one of 2025 we do also note that strong double digit increases to their earnings per share if you want to look as far out to december 2025 with their eps estimate their forward p will come down to around 12.23 if they can hit that target as we said three of the four last quarters 75 percent track record now what we also like to do here is look at some underlying metrics and some gradings the first one is the valuation so they do get a d minus First thing that we want to point out, their P on a non-GAAP basis, just under 16. Now, bear in mind the sector median as a whole, 10.96. So they are trading currently at a premium of around 45%. But you can argue, as we may find out later in the episode, that this is warranted and therefore it is right for them to be trading higher than the sector median. Remember, the sector median is just a group of companies in the same sector and it is the medium number of those as well in terms of looking at other metrics what we can see on a price to cash flow 4.61 versus 5.05 so a little bit lower same that can be said on a forward looking basis if you're looking at a price to book we do get the d plus and the d so not so great but again remember it will come down to which valuation methods you like to use in your own investment thesis the next metric we're looking at is the growth grade now they get a b minus overall one of the major reasons we're about to see now for this is their earnings per share. This is one thing we do quite like to look at. The growth over the next five years, 15% strong double digit year on year, whilst others have 5.16 which is interesting because they get an A rating for this. But then when you do look at their top line growth, negative 24%. Others in the sector, negative 8%. So oil and gas as a whole hasn't formed strongly on their top line. Even forward looking, they're expecting the decrease to continue. Negative 5%, whereas others in the sector, even though it is low single digit, it is positive at 2.51%. And we can see the same for the other metrics as well, the earnings before interest and tax. We can see that growth strong double digit decrease. Whereas others, while it is double digit, a lot lower. So do factor that in. Interesting though, they get a B minus as a lot of this is weighted towards that earnings per share growth, which is anticipated to be very strong double digits, especially when you consider it is a lot better, 191% better than others in the industry. We then take a look at their profitability grade. They get an A, so nice to see some positive gradings. Now profit margin or gross profit margin to be specific, just under 60%. Sector mean as a whole, 44%, so a lot better. Bottom line as well, marginally better, 16% versus the sector at just under 12%. And when we take a look at their cash from operations, massive amount here, 11.5 billion, others at 605 million. So 
Mixed results as a whole, just a conclusion to this part of the analysis. One buy rating from Seeking Alpha, a double hold from the other two analysts, D minus on valuation, B minus on growth, with an A on profitability. Now let's just take a look at how it compares its performance to others in the industry, whether there's any trends we can pick up on. We have Suncor Energy, any as well, Cenovis Energy, and a few others. What we do note over the last year, now do factor in this is total return, including dividends reinvested. They are the worst performing by quite some margin at 1.71%. When we expand this over the last five years, not the worst performing, but again, in the bottom three, up only 39%. And if you've been a shareholder for the last 10 years, even after putting in those dividends back into the company, you would be down negative 17%. So quite interesting. Warren Buffett obviously sees a lot of opportunity here. He is adding significantly to a position he already holds. But as I would say, past performance is not an indicator of the future. So it will be interesting to see where this stock is headed for over the next 12 to 24 months. Now, just very quickly, we want to see how they've compared to the S&P. A lot of people will say, just put that money into the S&P 500. Don't worry about picking individual stocks. Well, let's just take a look year to date. The S&P is up 12%. Occidental, well, it's pretty much flat. When you extend this over the last year, again, S&P far outweighing that. When we expand this to the last five years, you can see the current trend, the S&P 500 over the longer term has performed significantly better over the last 10 years, as we can see, no question about it. In fact, if you have Occidental Petroleum, you would be down around 18%. So something just to factor in, we're not here to say whether or not it is the best investment, but you have all the information there, include it into your own investment analysis. But as we can see, pretty much every single point over the last 10 years, the S&P 500 has outperformed. Now, before we jump in to the dividend safety, just to let you know, we've released our latest free weekly article, 12 undervalued dividend stocks, high quality companies. If you want access to this or any others, all completely free, Click on that pinned comment below, sign up, and you can start reading straight away. Also, to let you know how to find undervalued stocks, we run through all the websites and resources. So for those that are interested in the websites we use, you can find that all out there. Now, dividend safety, a score of 60, so it is borderline safe. Well, let's touch upon that today. Market cap, 53 billion. It is a large cap company. And when we look at the dividend safety, just a few weeks ago, it was reaffirmed that essentially there is a moderate risk of a dividend cut over a full economic cycle. Remember, with that full economic cycle, you will get the highs and the lows of the industry as a whole. In terms of the key metrics, so this is from the last recession, increase the dividend during the 07-09 Great Recession. They had negative 42%, significantly below the S&P, which was negative 12, but they did significantly outperform, interestingly enough, negative 23% return, S&P negative 55. In terms of dividend growth, but what we can notice, they don't increase those dividends every year. It does come down to the market conditions. Nice double digit increase in December, 22%. But over the last five years, if you've been a shareholder, that dividend is down 25% year on year. Over the last 20 years, only 2%. Bear in mind, just to keep up in line with inflation, we want to see 4%. And graphically, we can see a massive cut in 2019, all the way down to 2021, where it was very minimal. And as we can see, it has started to increase over the last few years, hence why they have two years of consecutive increases. As always, dividend yield theory does state the company is undervalued when the current yield sits above the five-year average. Massive sign of undervaluation, 1.46 versus 0.88. Just bear in mind, we're not looking at any of these models in isolation. And we can see here forward PE 13.8. It is above the five-year rolling of 9.7. And in fact, it isn't too far off the energy sector at 12. Occidental sitting at 13.7. Now, in terms of the measurements, as always, we like to focus on the free cash flow power. Remember, the earnings is susceptible to manipulation by management through accounting. Below 40% if we want to be specific for oil producers. For me, I have a blanket rule of 60%. Over the last few years, though, we can see it is pretty much below the 40% level. 11% in 2023, 13% in 2024 expected. But also look prior to that, the data is there. It is very volatile, as we can see. So do bear that in mind. It will come down to the economic conditions in a cyclical company. Now, free cash flow per share, we always want to see this consistently increasing, if possible, or at least not decreasing. Over the longer term, Occidental has increased. But do note the cyclicality, two of the last 10 years have been negative, And we do see quite a lot of years where it does fall 2022 2023 is an example. 2024 is also expected to be a very small drop. So let's factor that in when we do look at our margin of safety. In terms of sales growth, well, 3 to 7%. And as we can see here, five of the last 10 years, so five years of positive growth, 
five years of negative growth, and they're not just low single digit. In fact, four of them are strong, large double digit negative growth. Again, bear that in mind, as well as the negative 24% to the top line on a trailing 12 month basis. And this graph pretty much shows what we saw earlier, the cyclicality over the longer term. Also, what we wanna point out, we love it when companies do share buybacks, returning excess cash. They've done the opposite. They would have diluted your position over the longer term, 781 to 954 in the latest period. Yes, they have done some share buybacks in 22 to 23, but over the longer term, as you can see, it would be a net share dilution. In terms of ROIC, as always, 10% or more. If you wanna be specific, again, 8% for oil producers. Very inconsistent. In fact, some of the years where it is negative, it does make sense given these were the years that they did make a loss that we did discuss earlier. 10% in the more recent year, 9% on a trading 12 month basis. Operating margin, free cash flow margin. Again, we can just see not just the cyclicality, but also the fact that they didn't turn a profit in a few of those last 10 years. Last three years, though, looking fairly positive above that 12%. So that is nice to note, as well as the trailing 12 months. The same can be said for the free cash flow margin. Last four years looking very strong, 19% again on a trailing 12 month basis. Finally, we get to the net debt to EBITDA that helps us explain that essential dividend safety. EBITDA earnings before interest, tax, depreciation, amortization below 1.5. Remember, number of years to pay off all their debt, net of cash on hand. And this whole metric does correlate to balance sheet strength as well as dividend safety. First thing we note, a lot of inconsistency year on year. 1.28, not that bad as it is below the 1.5. Next year anticipated 1.19. So again, not that bad. It is below the 1.5, although we do note the inconsistencies and the volatility when we were looking at the free cash flow power. So do bear that in mind with this company. They have cut the dividend before, in fact, not too long ago. So always factor that in if this is a very important thing for you as an investor. So let's jump into the valuation model. As always, if you do enjoy the content values being provided, smash that like button, hit that subscribe and bell button so you are continually notified of these videos as they drop. So the first model we're looking at is Graham's valuation. We have the stock ticker symbol, earnings per share, long-term growth rate, AAA corporate bond yield, which gives us an intrinsic value just under $75. With the market value, we have our first undervaluation signal. Just consider the fact that we're not looking at any of these models in isolation and we will conclude shortly. The second one that we're considering is the multiples valuation model. Now we have companies in a similar sector and size. Their average P multiplied by the EPS of Occidental gives an intrinsic value showing some massive overvaluation. Now what this effectively means is that this company is trading at a much higher forward P than the others that we can see here, something that we did discuss earlier on in the episode but it could be that you do believe it is warranted based on the other metrics, but again, something just to consider for your own investment thesis. We then look at the dividend discount model. As we can see, a lot of inconsistency year on year. Average growth rate looking very silly. As we can see, they pretty much cut it down and it did grow. On terms of the forward-looking number, we put 6.75%. To be more conservative, the last two have been very strong double-digit growth. This gives an intrinsic value of $75, market value 60, so we do have another undervaluation signal. And then we have the DCF model, free cash flow year on year. Average growth rate, 25%. Now the market is expecting this to be negative. So we have gone from negative 2%. We have gone for negative 2% just to be on the more conservative side. With the discount rate, we get the present value of future free cash flows and terminal value. Add together with the cash, subtract total debt, get to the equity value, divide by shares outstanding. And we can see here another undervaluation signal. Now in terms of the intrinsic value in today's episode, it is the average of these three models. As you can see, we have excluded the multiple valuation, but we did run through it. So if you do want to include it, you can can incorporate that into your own analysis. This gives us an intrinsic value on average of $76. And one of the reasons that we did exclude this, other than the fact that it is trading at a more higher forward P, and you could substantiate that it is warranted, is that the other three models do have very similar numbers. So you could gain some confidence in that. However, to mitigate any issues, we are also adding in a margin of safety. And don't forget, you can click on the pinned comment below, grab a copy of the valuation model to get to the intrinsic value and acceptable buy price companies in your own portfolio as well as those on your watch list or those that you are considering to buy. In terms of margin of safety, we always use 10% and we execute on if it meets our three golden criteria, a wide moat, strong financial metrics, good forward looking data. If you believe that for Occidental it is a buy up to $68, then we keep going till it's near the current trading price. And we can see in today's episode, Occidental Petroleum has an MOS level based on our estimates and judgments of around 20%. In terms of Wall Street, well, their forecast isn't too dissimilar to our intrinsic value, $73 
Upside of 22%, they do consider this one something that maybe you should think about in the portfolio if it is an area that maybe you don't have covered or maybe like we did cover earlier, you would rather just put that money towards the S&P 500. As always, let us know, are you looking to add this similar to Warren Buffett has done just over the last few days? Is this on your watch list? Or maybe oil and gas as a whole just isn't an industry you want to incorporate into your own portfolio. As always, if you've enjoyed today's episode, smash that like button, hit that subscribe and bell button. Let us know your thoughts below. And as always, we'll see you all on the next one.